There was an art installation in London on the fourth plinth in Trafalgar Square where members of the public were allowed hour-long slots to go and stand on this plinth in Trafalgar Square at any time of day or night. And I did that. I was on at, I think, seven o'clock on a warm summer Sunday evening for an hour. And you're quite exposed there. You're quite vulnerable. And lots of people coming and going. And you would think it's a bit like being in the stocks and you might be pilloried or ridiculed. And I was struck by however many people came and went as I was standing there up on this plinth, how much people wanted me to succeed and have a nice time and what fun they had and I had. And it just made me think that when bad things happen, when people do bad things, it is always the most tiny minority of them, but we somehow extrapolate that into most people, and it's never most people. It's always a tiny minority. I was really struck. That was a real life lesson to me standing up there. Ethan Devitt, and welcome to the 50 Faces podcast, a podcast committed to revealing the richness and diversity of the world of investment by focusing on its people and their stories. I'm joined today by James Brooke Turner, who is director of Yoke & Co and investment director of the Nuffield Foundation. He was voted one of the inaugural four inspiring leaders in the voluntary sector and writes about financial governance for charities. Welcome, James. Thanks for joining me today. Thank you. Well, let's start with your background. Where did you grow up? What did you study? And how did you come to enter the world of investing ultimately? My father travelled, so I had a sort of peripatetic child, which was very interesting. But I ended up studying, I think of myself as an art historian, first and foremost. Because that's what I studied. I studied. My period was Baroque art, which I studied at the Courtauld Institute in London. And that stayed with me. But I've never worked in that field. I've never worked in an art field although I think of myself as an art historian. I think any other art historian wouldn't accept me in that world at all. And I came to investing because I was working as a grant maker initially, where you're handing out money and the return comes as a social benefit. And I slowly moved into finance. And I found finance really interesting. You know, when you look at a syllabus or something, you think, gosh, there wasn't anything in the syllabus about accounting oddly, that I didn't find really interesting, which is strange coming from an art history background, I suppose. I do. I think they're rather similar in some ways because they're all about balance. And so I drifted from there into working in charity finance. I worked for a charity called the Muscular Dystrophy Campaign, where I was their finance director. And I did that for about five years. And then I went to the Nuffield Foundation in about 2000, 2001, which is where I've been since. I went there firstly as a sort of operations director and then my role changed and now I do a couple of days a week looking after their investment portfolio which is about 500 million pounds and the rest of the time I run a small business which is trying to help charities which have got endowed funds to be better clients of investment managers so that those two worlds sort of worked quite well together. But a lot to unpack there. But first, I want to ask about your art history background, because I always find it fascinating. And I think I cited before in another podcast, they did a study of medical students who did a, sort of a minor in art history or simply just a semester course. And they found that after that, they were actually a lot better at analysis, at reasoning by analogy, and just in perspective in general. So what do you think you bring with you from your art history training when you look at maybe whether it be charities or investing? Do you use that skill at all? Specifically art history, I suspect not. I think the secret, which must apply to your friends as well, is that they haven't come from a finance background. So they sit on the side of the table with, with everybody else who doesn't really understand finance. So their questions have a different starting place. That's always useful. You don't automatically assume that two plus two is going to be four. You take longer to get there it beds in in your mind in a slightly different way. I think that's why they say, if you're looking for accountants, don't choose somebody who's read maths or physics. Choose somebody who's read music or English literature. Very interesting. Now looking at the charity sector, since it's a sector that you spend time mm. consulting with, 
what do you think should be at the forefront of the mind of leaders in the charity sector today? What are some of the headwinds that they're facing and, and some of the primary concerns? I think charities could not be more interesting. They are such a fantastic sort of class of investor. And they're so different to pension funds. And I think it's misunderstood or it's not understood widely enough. A pension fund has to pay out money to a series of beneficiaries. And the pension fund has a piece of paper. It's got all their names and addresses on it. And so they mustn't run short of their obligations. A charity has to pay out its money to beneficiaries, but it hasn't got a piece of paper with names and addresses. It can expand or contract them as much as it wants. So it's not possible for a charity to fail to deliver its mission in terms of having enough money to meet its beneficiaries' needs because it doesn't have a defined group of specific beneficiaries. And that's really powerful. So whereas pension funds think about what they need to have at some future point, charities tend to reference themselves by have they maintained a historic value? So it's not defined by the future, it's defined by the past. And that means you don't get involved in any sort of actuarial assessment or valuation, regular valuation methodology problems, becomes a really pure investment vehicle. That's the first thing. There's quite a lot there, but that's really interesting. And then beyond that, what I feel really passionate about is that the point about a charity is that it's there to spend money. That's how it delivers what it's meant to do. And charities that save money and grow in real terms, for me, are therefore broadly speaking, failing in their purpose because they're failing to spend the money they've got and they're deciding to save it instead. I tend to have an image in my mind of like a reservoir of money and a dam and the trustees tend to be the dam and the beneficiaries are down in the valley below. And you're thinking, why are the trustees keeping all that money from the beneficiaries? Sometimes there are good reasons like capacity issues. But sometimes there aren't. But it's the trustees who stand between the beneficiaries and the money they're holding for them. And have you seen any of your peer charities come under pressure through COVID? Perhaps a lot of events were not held. Charitable giving may have been compromised. From what I've seen, I think they've all been really good. I think they've all launched special initiatives. I think they've been very quick about launching special initiatives. I know Nuffield has done A lot of really interesting work on, I mean, it's just we found social science and there can't be anything more interesting for a social science than when the whole of society is shut down and people can't even go out. That doesn't happen very often. So we've funded a lot of research on how people have responded to that. And one research we've been funding, Daisy Fancourt, has produced pretty much weekly outputs which were cited in all the major press outlets on you know, how people felt about the lockdown, how it was affecting their mental health. And that's going to be an extraordinary body of evidence lasting long into the future. Maybe we'll want to look back on this period. So I think Nuffield and other charities have really done well. More recently, they've done really well on Ukraine. A lot of people have made special initiatives to help in ways they can, particularly refugee, that sort of thing. And from an investment standpoint now, given the charitable status, what's on your mind at the investment side of things? You can have a long time horizon, I presume. Do you have a need for income? What are you discussing at your investment committees? I mean, the key thing is the long time horizon. We've all got an incredibly long time horizon. So at Nuffield, our portfolio is basically 90% in equities, 10% in cash for liquidity. And I think it's been like that for about 20 years. People talk about the long term all the time, but I think there isn't such a thing. There's a series of sort of short term events all tied together. So maybe five year events, and then there's a change of personnel and a review or something like that. So the long term is much more subtle in to generally do the same thing for 20 years. So we've done it nothing is a much rarer sort of animal. But that's beset with dangers, isn't it, about complacency and things like that and not keeping up with progress in the investing area. And so what does, on their mind, it's the same things. It's always the same things. It's always going to be inflation, liquidity, returns, spend rates. 
And having said it's always the same, it's all just changed. There is now a real sort of recognition that aligning your mission with your assets through responsible investing is, is absolutely central. And that's a new world that everybody, clients and managers, are having to come to terms with really quickly. How do you go about that? Are you specifically seeking impact? Are you looking at the e-side, so the, the carbon footprint of your portfolio and lowering that? Are you looking at governance, diversity, or all the above? The way we think about it and the way I think about it is what we're used to is we're used to delegating financial decisions to managers. So they decide on our behalf which companies to buy on the basis of what's going to produce the best long-term return. Now, as well as delegating financial decisions, we're delegating moral decisions So what we want to know is, do our managers share the same sort of moral compass that we do? And that's much more difficult to establish. You can't get that from a set of numbers or a 10-year history. You have to talk to them, and then you have to try and evidence how they think about things and how they put that into practice. And everybody's learning that. I think one of the lessons is that it's a lot more work. Responsible investing is a lot more work. So What underpins it, what makes it a lot more work, is you have to know what you own in some detail and why you own it. And I think that's been a surprise. I think it's absolutely the right thing to be doing. And it's quite revealing. But I think everybody is learning how to navigate and sort of present and understand this world. Let's talk about governance specifically, because you have an investment committee. I recently saw you were looking to add to that investment committee. So what, in your view, makes an optimal governance model for an investment committee? How does yours work Mm. in particular? So we are really interested in the long term. What we have is people who stay for a long time, like me, I've been there 20 years. We have three members who are trustees who are not investment specialists. They're intelligent academics, could be in economics, could be in geography, something like that. And they stay as long as they're trustees, which tend to be about 10, 12 years. And That means that everybody on that committee is familiar with why we do things, the way we do things, sort of the investment beliefs that we have. You can deal in shorthand those things. You don't have to keep pulling the plant up to see if the roots are healthy. And then the way we introduce challenge is we have two external advisors who sit on the committees. They vote pari passu with the other members. And they rotate it every six years. And when one leaves, they write a sort of valedictory statement on what they thought worked well, what might be improved. And when the new one joins, they look at everything and say, does that make sense to them? Can we see what's working, what's not? That's critical to sort of having a sense of the continuum, but also some challenge. The second element is the relationship with the trustee body, because if that fails, then everything fails. I think if the trustees suddenly lose confidence in the investment strategy, then all bets are off. So we spend a lot of time making sure that's solid. And we do that in two ways. One, we have the chairman of the trustees, who's not an investment person, chairs the investment committee. So if the investment committee says we need to have some derivative cryptocurrency swap, if there is such a thing, the chairman of the investment committee would think, when I'm sharing the whole foundation, am I going to be able to explain this and justify this to the non-investment trustees? So that puts a natural break on things that are too esoteric. And so I think the chairman represents all the trustees at the same time. And I think that gives it a level of stability and admittedly some simplicity, but which suits our level of operation. And the second thing we do is the investment committee as a whole presents once every couple of years to the trustee body. And the trustee body is they're able to ask any questions that might keep them awake at night. So it's not a closed box. It's the trustee's investment policy, not the committee's investment policy. It's the link which is really important, I think, to make sure it works, it functions, and it's transparent. Lots of interrogation, it seems, and kind of checks and balances there. Let's talk about the actual chair function itself. You mentioned where the chair comes from and who they have to report to and be accountable to. In terms of actually functioning as a chair, what do you see makes an effective chair? Well, there are different models, aren't there? One of the things about having been in the same place for such a long time is there are a limited number of models you've seen. So I've really only seen the one where the chair is the chairman of the committee. I think in an odd way, I think the best answer to this question is that 
there's a book by Edith Hall called Introducing the Ancient Greeks. And it describes the 10 characteristics in her mind that made the ancient Greeks such a powerful cultural force that we still reference it in so much of our thinking. And they included things like curiosity, an ability to argue with each other and to disagree in a non-confrontational way, the enjoyment of argument and discussion, laughter, because it diffuses situations. I always like that one. There's a whole range of things, but they are based around curiosity, respect, enthusiasm and enjoyment. Those are all important. Even if you might not understand the issues you're facing, those would probably equip you, like curiosity, to follow them through. So that would probably be my answer to that. Slightly eccentric. From the history of art to ancient Greeks, where we're getting a lot of rich sources here, so I appreciate all of that. Um, let's now move on to looking into the crystal ball a little bit. I know that it's uh, impossible, but from your vantage point, having been in this role for some time, being immersed in the charity sector and consulting to them, if you were to look at sort of five to 10 years, how do you see the charity sector evolving and maybe as it pertains to investment needs as well? I think over the next 10 years, how you respond to inflation is going to be a big thing. I think probably bigger is how one is going to respond to quantitative tightening as, as central bank balance sheets start to sort of shrink, perhaps, and the consequences for asset prices. I think the responsible investment thing is going to be important. And I think specifically for charities, there's a, another dimension that doesn't apply to pension funds because pension funds have an actuarial test. They need to meet a valuation test. And charities don't. So charities are inclined to think, in my experience, that the largest amount of money is the same as their normal amount of money, so to which they're entitled. So everything's always referred to as a loss from a high point, not how much you've gained from a low point. And I think one of the things charities are going to have to face in the next 10 years is that you might have a period of returns of CPI minus two or something for some years. And that would take some readjusting. That lovely Irish punchline, you wouldn't start from here. You wouldn't start from your maximum value. You'd say, well, we've still got twice as much money as we had 10 years ago. So we're doing pretty well like that. So I think that's going to be the issue. It's how charities come to terms with the fact that they might not be at their all-time high watermark. But nevertheless, that's not necessarily a bad thing. They can still carry on spending really quite fully. And how about the evolution of charities and products? Back in the day, I remember there were many charity products that were set up around distribution schemes, perhaps, or having a distribution share class, which charities needed. Do you see more customization of products suitable for charities, or, or do they still need that distribution feature? Yeah, charities, because they're spending, they're all the spending, they need uh, distributions. And more old-fashioned charities and managers tend to go for income products where you get a natural income. And that tends to mean that you're investing, the accounting for something is driving your investment strategy. So the accounting tail is wagging the investment dog, which isn't a sensible thing to do. So there's a great focus on total return, which is widespread in the pension industry, but in the charity industry, not at all, because we still account for income and capital separately, oddly. And so trustees do get very exercised about whether or not they have enough income to cover their spending. So some charities have moved to total return and managed it that way. Some funds, charitable funds, are able to distribute on a total return basis, though they don't necessarily do that, but they can spend capital as long as it's sustainable. And those are called charity authorised investment funds. So they're an attractive new weapon in the armoury. But things like private equity, much more complicated for income dependent charities, unless you can get it in a fund structure that's going to give you a regular source of income that you can count as income. Do you want to speak now about your mission alignment? We've already touched on it, but how that translates specifically, given your focus on socioeconomic research and impact. Do you look specifically at impact? Are you just looking at across the board at ESG integration? And I'd also love to hear your thoughts on diversity in the financial services industry and maybe among your managers. Starting with diversity, 
what you want are the best people do in the best roles. I think everybody would want that. Everybody wants a meritocracy, I think. And what you want is the best access so the best people can get into the best roles. And that we spend a lot of time working on how you can help that to happen. So how you can deal with it's the opportunities that in the years from naught to five, where we spend a lot of time focusing on the impact of poverty and on life outcomes. So in terms of that, that's how Nuffield spends its money. In terms of how we invest, what we really want is, we tend to refer to it as orthogonality, which is a different way of saying diversity. What we want is cognitive diversity. And however that comes, we want merit, cognitive diversity. But I don't think we are a sort of organisation that will be quota-driven, but we want to see more diversity. I think the trouble that a profession like the investment industry has is it's at a senior level, it's a reflection of what things were like 30 years ago. So what one should hope for is that in 30 years' time, the range of people working in the investment industry will be vastly different to how it is today and much more balanced and nuanced, I think. That's really how we see it. That was one of the characteristics of the ancient Greeks, their love of diversity, diverse arguments, diverse points of view, multiculturalism, extraordinary. Well, you couldn't say it doesn't make life more interesting to have some variance. I would agree with that. And let's go back to your personal story now. So you've had a long career. What would you say were some of the career highs and lows in there? I remember at the time, this is before I was in investments, I was in charge of a service that looked at how people with muscular dystrophy were, the sort of support networks were for them. And I organized a conference between academics and practitioners, people who provided care services and people who studied the diseases. And I don't think anybody had done that before. And there were such obvious learnings from it that it was a really powerful outcome. And just having a two-day conference just meant that people's lives would be radically improved by that little learning that would have come from some of those sessions. That was probably the most direct thing, I feel. I've done in my career. There are much more indirect things. Like, like if you work somewhere like Nuffield for as long as I have, you will have seen huge amounts of money pass through your hands and going to fund really interesting work. So those are the highlights. The lowlights are always as interesting. For example, when you sell shares that you turned up not to have delivery of, that's a complete nightmare. When you suddenly think you've been told you've got some shares, you sell them. And then it turns out that actually the paper isn't in your name yet. Those are what we call heart stoppers. Those are the moments like when you realise you've got uh, the wrong decimal place in a calculation that's going to a trustee or something. Those are absolute heart stoppers. But I suppose as you get older, you get more used to them. Oh, yeah. Heart stoppers, stomach uh, churners. I I think we've all been there. (laughs) I think selectively, we do try to not remember the feeling because it is quite unique. Um, Uh, Let's look at some key people. You must have in the charity sector through investment committees and otherwise encountered some extraordinary individuals. Is there anyone in particular who was either a mentor or made an impression on your career? All sorts of people, all sorts of people. I think one of the things about Nuffield is that it's a very academic place and they will think carefully about why something is so. So when we started to take responsibility for our own, our own asset allocation, nobody really knew anything about this, and including myself. We knew basically what equities were and things like that. And we were using a consultant at the time and we found that we didn't really understand that what their papers said. It used words like risk, which to us meant risk was a bad thing. So why would you want to take more risk? So we started going through everything and rethinking it all piece by piece. And that just led to a more and more and more and more interest on our behalf, and which is why we've ended up with this slightly unusual portfolio of 90% in equities, because we sort of thought everything through from first principles rather than using a more conventional asset allocation. So I think it's that, and it's people like, I mean, when I started the chair, I was a moral philosopher and was very good about saying, yes, we should do this or we shouldn't do this, and had 
I was really impressed with moral courage. I was really sick of that. But if something was a difficult decision, they didn't duck it. They just made sure they were certain about why they were going to do it that way and they were prepared to justify it. That's why we had a large private equity allocation very early on, a large equity allocation very early on. I think because they thought about these things, they were morally courageous. And I think that's what pays dividends. We can't have had this discussion about art history, the ancient Greeks, without you <laughs> referring to some other literature, I think, around words of wisdom. We've already shared quite a few. Are there any particular words of wisdom or a creed or motto that you live by? I think the diversity point is really important. I think being able to listen to what other people say, I think that's... Well, other people, they'll just know so much more than you all know, and you'll be able to cherry-pick the best of it. There was a art installation in London on the fourth plinth in Trafalgar Square where members of the public were allowed hour-long slots to go and stand on this plinth in Trafalgar Square at any time of day or night, and I did that. I was on at, I think, 7 o'clock on a warm summer Sunday evening for an hour, and you're quite exposed there, you're quite vulnerable, and lots of people coming and going. And you would think it's a bit like being in the stocks and you might be pilloried or ridiculed. And I was struck by however many people came and went as I was standing there up on this plinth, how much people wanted me to succeed and have a nice time and what fun they had and I had. And it just made me think that when bad things happen, when people do bad things, it is always the most tiny minority of them. But we somehow extrapolate that into most people, and it's never most people. It's always a tiny minority. I was really struck. That was a real life lesson to me standing up there. Well, James, that that is a wonderful image that I will not lose of you standing up there in that plinth (laughs) and looking down on humanity itself. And I wanted to thank you for such a wonderfully rich and diverse set of topics here that we've covered on this podcast. I have really enjoyed speaking with you and catching up, really. We did interact some time ago professionally. I could have spent Mm. hours here discussing it with you, but I will put some of the sources in the show notes so our listeners can catch up on the ancient Greeks. Thank you for coming and sharing your insights with us. It's an absolute pleasure. You ask such good questions. I'm Ethan David. Thank you for listening to the 50 Faces podcast. If you liked what you heard and would like to tune in to hear more inspiring investors and their personal journeys, please subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be construed as investment advice and all views are personal and should not be attributed to the organizations and affiliations of the host or any guest. 